But we're on an exciting journey as a church, and um, if you are fairly new to Doxaday, you'll hear that we've got a thing going all the time. We're never just happy with what it was like last week. Uh, we just can't help it. And um, we've got a bit of FOMO that will miss out on what God is doing. So we're calling it FOMO because we don't we want to really want to be the ones that said we wish we knew, we wish we were there. Okay. And in this time of the year, there are some. FOMO realities. Perhaps you see all these advertisements for Black Friday. They call it Black November now. I don't know how, these, how long these specials are going to be. And you think, ooh, I always needed that. You don't, no, but you feel. <laughs> when the price goes low enough, you just feel you needed it a little more. No? Um, and maybe you've got FOMO with, have you spent enough time on this for the year? Or you know, have you got the promotion coming that you wanted? Or, or you know, are you... Are you connected enough with the right people in your life? So we have a little bit of FOMO of this time of the year, but that's not the kind of FOMO we want to talk about. We call it family on mission opportunities. Family on mission opportunities where we want to say, God, what is it that you say about the church? And that's why I said if you're new to us, you'll probably get a different picture if you're maybe not used to a church that talks about mission and these opportunities. What do we mean with that? And I pray that at the end of this morning, you will have a bit of a better understanding of what God's actual plan is with the church and how this mission that we're on have a bit more relevance to you and a bit more clarity on what exactly it means. And this morning, I want to talk about a missional community. So last week, we spoke about the individual and where every, every one of us is called by God to be on a mission. You don't come to a mission, you are that mission. And we are here to help one another be on that mission. What is, what is that mission? To be faith, love, and hope to the world. To know that people have Jesus in their lives. That's your mission. And you can't wait for somebody else to do it. It's yours. And sometimes it's like an overwhelming idea. Me? Yes. God spoke to every one of us. You've got the Holy Spirit, and He empowers you to do great things. And we have to figure out what it is for us individually. But then also, what does it look like as a community? And that's where the church discussion comes in. And last week, I showed this diagram, and we're going to show it a few times, probably for the foreseeable future, because it helps you understand how it works in a church. First of all, there's a missional individual that we call city changes that understand God called me personally, but that we are put together in a community which is called the church, and the individuals serve together. You see that bottom bracket showing that we become a church, and then next week, Miller will explain to us how it works in an ecosystem in a city because we see churches work together like never before in the city. We tell international people visiting, they don't believe us. Every church on its own, buddy, say, not in the city. Here we work together for God, and we're in a good space. And um, as we serve the city, we'll see how the city can empower the church again to empower the individual. And this is where God has called us to function in that kind of way. Now, if you look at what it means to be a missional community, we have to look at the definition of that. First of all, a mission, and I looked it up on Google, and it knows everything, a mission is an important assignment given to a person or group of people. I thought, amen, that's us. And, now I know Google gives you what the majority of the people in your area think of that definition, but it gave us the second definition, true story, the calling of the church. I thought, hey Google, you know something? That's actually true. Because we are a church called to be people with an assignment as individuals and as a group. So what is a community? A social group of any size, whose members reside in a specific locality. I said, that's us, share government, that's us, and often have a common culture and historical heritage. I said, God, we're a missional community. So my conclusion in thinking about this is, a missional community is a healthy church doing its God thing. That's my definition. I didn't put it up there because it sounds a little weird. But, but as a church, we're, we're a community that has to figure out what it is that we're on a mission on. Now, as I said before, if you come from a church where you've never heard any of this conversation, then you'll easily read whatever we're doing here, comparing it with your history, and go, what is this all about? But you have to realize that as a church, God is speaking to us now, and you have to open your heart a little bit to a possibility of having another perspective of what church is supposed to be. Because we don't want to have FOMO of missing out, of walking in the power 
of God. Now, I want to read to you um, the Great Commission, where this mission, the Great Co-Mission, working with God on His mission, was given. And you know it very well. If, you've, if you're a Christian for three years, you have probably have heard this a few times already. And this is where Jesus speaks to the disciples, and He said, Guys, mission, you ready? And then this is what he says to them. Jesus came up and said to them, All authority, all power of absolute rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Help the people to learn of me, believe in me and obey my words. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And lo, that's strange that they have a slang in here. It's like, lo, no. And lo, I'm with you. It's not what it says, but it was funny in a moment. I'm with you always, remaining with you perpetually, regardless of circumstance, and on every occasion, even to the end of the age. This is a big mission moment. I, I, I felt like God was telling me, Hello, you're getting this, buddy. It's as old as that moment, and it's still as powerful every day since. And it's like the church have to figure out all the time, what does it mean in our current day Reality. I'm so glad Jesus didn't say the following to them. He said, disciples, build good buildings, have great Sunday services, drink fantastic coffee, survive till the next Sunday. If you feel okay, sleep late. If you don't, come back and somebody prays for you and you go again. The scary thing is we live sometimes like that. That's church to many people. And I, hear, I see people coming back and they hear and they engage again whatever place in the week on Sunday and say, where were you? Oh, no. It's really going bad. And I was okay. But I had a rough spot and I'm coming back to church and I hear it to have a little magic touch and off you go again. And I'm thinking, why don't you have FOMO? Aren't you afraid of missing out on living a powerful life with God and not coming back to just barely surviving and thinking God must pull you out of the ditch. That is not what Jesus said. And if church doesn't work for people, often it's because that's the understanding. Did Jesus not say this? No. He actually commissioned us. Why would he give us a, com a mission if it won't be for the benefit of us? As a good father, he won't say, it's hard work, guys. Just endure a little. See if you can make it. No, he's excited with us because it makes the church come alive. I've had people testify of being involved in what God has called them to do as an individual and part of the church and those who was waiting for a better coffee machine at the church, who's really irritated with a sound that's never perfect, who's so glad that we got these chairs because the wooden ones from the theater were very hard. The amount of satisfaction when everything is perfect is never anything in comparison to being a church fulfilling mission. So if you want the best experience, ask God to show you what your mission should be. Now, one of the most powerful analogies of what this missional community should be, I heard this week um, Tony Evans speaking of how church is like an embassy. Now, I don't know how many of you have political connections with other countries or understand the whole embassy thing, but an embassy is a group of of government officials headed by an ambassador who represent their government in a foreign country. Eh? So I think you all get that. That is the South African Embassy in Trafalgar Square in London. I voted there before and registered the birth of Sinead. And they represent South Africa in the heart of London. The rules governing the people working there are the South African rules. And all South Africans who want to be protected living in the UK can go there and be protected because they represent the full South Africa in one house. Okay? So you'll get the, the significance of that. The purpose of them being there is for the benefit of the relationship between that government and the one they reside in. So all the people working in the embassy has a connection of representing another kingdom in that space. It's actually a weird parallel reality. Now, some interesting facts. I have met several people that live close to where we live at the moment from different countries that choose to stay there, and they are also ambassadors representing their countries. And the one guy, he came here to visit once with his wife. I asked him, what's your mission? Why are you here for the great weather? And he said, well, it's nice. And few of them want to go back to their country. 
And he said, but the reason they are here, he, this specific person, in conversation told me, he is focused on agriculture. And his mission is to connect with people in South Africa and to bring the best practices from his country into South Africa and see how they can benefit us with their technology and what they've learned. I'm like, why aren't there many of you? No? You and how many people? No, that's his part of the whole story. But he's here for the benefit of us. But he's fully representing where he comes from. The other interesting thing to me is if, if a president... From, if the president of South Africa wants to engage the United Kingdom, he goes through the embassy. He doesn't just bypass. He calls the ambassador. Say, hey, listen, I want to speak to the prime minister, you know, and can we arrange something? And how is the relationship between us and them? He works through the embassy. That's the, the route through which communication works. Because their pure mission is to represent that original kingdom or, or nation and see how they can benefit that community. Isn't that how church is? If you make the parallel, the church positioned people representing a different kingdom reality, citizens of heaven, but still in the earth, but not off the earth. And God works through the church and is making the whole community benefit because of the embassy being in the community, representing a whole nother reality. It's like, God, I'm an ambassador. Now listen why this is so important. When, when Jesus spoke to the church. Or actually when he started the revelation of church, there's a moment that you probably know well in Matthew 16 where Jesus speaks to his disciples and said, listen, you've seen so many things, guys. Do you know who I am? Do you get who I am? And yeah, some people say Elijah and some say this and some say that. And he said, but who do you guys say? And it's a powerful moment because then we read in verse 16 to 18 in Matthew 16, Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, You are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock, upon this revelation, Peter, I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Now, why the embassy idea is so powerful? That word church in the Greek is ecclesia. Who's heard that word before? Okay. So ecclesia, I just thought, is the gathering of people. It's like you few in the room, close the door. Ah. Not what it means. I thought that because it feels good. Ecclesia is a legislative body. It's like a political assembly. The Greek people knew. When this was translated as Jesus spoke, he said, this is like a governing body with authority because whenever the people came together in the city hall or by the gates, it was the ecclesia that decided what that shit, that city, yeah, that was close. <laughs> they should stay out of there to get a better city. Yeah. So, online people, I really want to apologize for that moment. <laughs> It's really hot in here, isn't it? <laughs> city, city. Okay, focus. So the Ecclesia came together to make important authoritative decisions. And you think of church as a nice, bless me club? When Jesus said the church is the Ecclesia and I will give it the keys to unlock the kingdom, that's huge. For too long, perhaps, I've just said, God, but we are these people that are protected from this evil world. And just help us to love one another. And keep us out of that so that we live healthy, you know. But the Ecclesia is something very important. Where Jesus said, guys, if I put you together, it's because you've got authority to go on this mission and tell people about me. Not hoping and wishing that something will be done through my life, but walking into a space saying, God, if you have put me on a mission, then... I want to boldly go there with the love that Jesus had and still have for us. So the ecclesia, the church, what we are, this missional community, has got a very specific mission. For us to be on this mission, I was pondering and say, God, okay, we know this is not new to anybody. Maybe the urgency we have to get, but what does it mean for us to be on this mission? What are some of the things we have to consider as church and and through the many conversations that we have in the leadership of Doxadale, a great revelation has been found and discussed so that we get something of that picture. And one of it is that we need to be present. 
If you want to see something of the mission I'm on, you have to be with me. As a church, we need to be present. We can't somewhere on an island be there and, and think we'll have an impact on anything if nobody sees us or hears us. And I want to tell you that this is one of the reasons why we are in the Parkview Mall. We want to be present in community. Some of you sitting here smiling at me now came to us when COVID happened and the theater closed down and we didn't have a venue. We thought, let's go and look for a venue somewhere else. And some of you came to me and said, listen, we are not done with the mall. We need to be present here. People need to experience what God is doing. There must be a presence of God through the people that come here to worship. And I said, but where do you want us to go? Parking lot? You know, maybe in front of Nando. And then the management came to us and they said, what about this space? And God has made us just connect with people whose lives are situated here, centered here. And I've asked Cornell, who, how many of your team are here? Just stand up quickly, guys. So Cornell and his team, he's head of the security here. Sibiwe has been with us for many years. He, with great people like Sibiwe, are looking after the safety of this mall. And we are friends connecting and greeting and praying together so as often as we can. It's for people like them that we want to be here. We can either complain about everything that goes wrong, or we can pray for these people and have them be impacted by the love of God being present so that they become the ones bringing it as people on a mission themselves. Okay? So that's why we're here. We want to be a present church. And, and for the hard work, many hours, Cornell told me the week, your parade is what time? 10 to 6 in the morning. How many of you want to be at 10 to 6 in the morning at a parade? No, you don't want to. Don't put your hands down. They... <laughs> They are doing it so that this mall can thrive and we can be here as a church. So I want us to pray for them regularly, but now just applaud them of gratitude for what they're doing. They are representing many, many people in this mall that we have a relationship with. I want to share with you how we can be present. And the Doxedo family will share this everywhere, and we're going to probably share this many, many times. And I need people to help me this morning um, just to hold up some of these words. Um, the first thing of a present attitude is a fathering presence. Um, Johan, can I ask you as a father? Come and help me for a moment, please. And... I just want you to hold it as well, just to emphasize it. Here is a father of this house and in the church and to me. Um, so a fathering presence is a way that we as a missional community function. Okay? What does it mean to, be a, uh, to, to have that? That is where you are aware as a father of whatever is wrong in your, in your space. When I walk into my home, and I know Johan with his, his kids and his grandchildren, he will not sit still if a child walks in bleeding, going, oh, just don't bleed on my floor. You know. He will look after him immediately. There's a fathering attitude to a community that we, as a, as a missional community, must have that attitude to say, God, what is it that you want us to be aware of? Does my heart break for? Am I just wishing somebody... Alamut, they should do something. Or are you at a place where you want to go, no, I want to have a fathering presence that wherever we, we go as individuals, but as a church together, that they go, you are typically from Doxa Day because you just want to engage with these people. You're asking, what can I do? Not somebody should do something. Okay? There's an important scripture, Colossians 3 verse 12. It's not on the screen, but it says, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, allowing for other people's faults, and you have to, above everything, love them. That's what a father does. So as a community, we have to pray, God, will you show us? Will you help our hearts to just have a little opening? Everywhere we go, to say, God, is there any brokenness here that I need to be aware of? Do I, I'm tempted to close my eyes and just go, no, not me, not today, not any day. Or say, God, as a church, what are we aware of? And saying, God, don't use anybody else, me first. Being ready for that. Okay, fathering presence. Thank you, Johan. Not too long. Um, the next one is a faithful presence. A faithful presence. Desiree? Come and be my faithful presence, please. She's been faithfully present in so many years of my ministry. So a faithful presence is another reality. And this is 
a fascinating one because if you think of being faithful, you think of being there all the time doing stuff. The greatest testimony of a church is who we are before we do. It's to be before you do. Because the condemnation we find as a church is you're not doing well enough. You're a church in the city. There are so many things still wrong. True. And, and we probably will not on our own be able to cover all the brokenness unless the church of the whole city comes together. But this speaks of being faithful in who we are because this is about people who grasp Christ that understand that our identity as sons and daughters of God defines who we are and now we walk into a space and we're just faithfully us. And you say, God, I'll, before I do anything, help me to get you. Because when I don't do great enough, I'm not filled with condemnation. And the devil going, oh, but you said you're such a great Christian. Look what you're doing. That's an old lie. We can't fall for that anymore. We're saying, I am a son of the living God, full of grace, full of power. And I'm just going to love people and be the revelation of Christ so that people can see me before I do anything and just get there's something about you. And now the outflow of who we are will become visible as well. But as a church, we can't be missional unless we are faithfully the people that God called in that capacity. As an ambassador, you walk into a space differently. You know that you represent something and someone as, as a Christ follower, when you walk into a space, you know you represent an incredible king that goes, oh, there she is. She's in her workplace. <laughs> I wonder who's going to notice because that person needs to see the way that she speaks. The conviction she has when she prays for somebody, that, that guy needs to see it. Oh, I can't wait to see what my child is going to do because she represents faithfully the grace of God in her life. Incredible. So our faithful presence needs to be defined in this way. People only see the gospel when the church is faithfully present, representing Christ. It's the strongest testimony that Jesus is alive, the size at which we believe it. In 2 Corinthians 2 verse 15, the message paraphrase says it like this. It's through us, through us, he brings knowledge of Christ. Everywhere we go, people breathe in the exquisite fragrance because of Christ, we give of a sweet scent rising to God, which is recognized by those on the way of salvation, an aroma redolent with life. That is what God called us to be. So if we want to be missional as a community, say, God, who I am, who you called me to be, full of grace and love, help me to be faithfully representing you wherever I go. Thank you, Des. So that's how we are present, as fa fathering presence, a faithful presence, and now the last one is fruitful presence. Aila, let me pick on you. You're the closest. Come stand here. A fruitful presence is where the expression of love in us and through us becomes visible. Not, without, not with you going, there it is. But the natural outflow of who you are. And you will hear it until it comes out of your ears and then it will be enough that faith and love and hope, wherever we go, faith, love and hope. And we will show this diagram to you uh, for as long as we can. Wherever you are at, if this is your prayer, say, God, I want to be faithfully aware of what's broken as a father in my, in my heart. I want to be faithful in my identity of who I am. And Lord, will you come and please use me so that the love that I have for people will make people see Jesus and the respond in faith, faith for the people that are lost. If you can introduce somebody to this life giver Jesus, that's your mission. If you can have love for people that are broken, that don't believe that it even exists, and you love them to the point where they go, my goodness, this is real. What is the matter with you? Well, I love this God who loved me first. And if your engagement with people can bring them hope, that say, listen, every time I'm done in a conversation with you, I look forward to the week. And I walked in here desperate, not wanting Monday to start, but now I can't wait for it to happen. What is it that you do? We just give the hope. Because the broken that people carry is restored in conversation where a godly person is on a mission. Isn't that great? And that's who we are, and that's what we do. Thanks, Ayla. Last week, I shared with you, if you were not here, maybe go and watch it online again. Uh, for us to, to see this become a reality, there's a, there's a power shift, a mind switch that needs to happen. 
It's like a, a next gear for us. And this helped me a lot, um, these eight different things that, that move you from a place of going, great idea, what do I do? And last week I shared a couple of things. First of all, that we need to have concern to compassion. You can't just be aware of the brokenness and go, oh, this is bad, but you need to have a broken heart. It's a mind shift for you to become missional, okay? To have all these kind of different ways of being present in reality, we have to have compassion like Christ have for us and for the world. Secondly, last week I shared we should not condemn our city and be very brave in telling everybody how wrong it is, but we need to, we need to pray for and engage our city, seek its prosperity so that we can be blessed by it. I also shared that we have to encourage one another, yes, but equip one another. If you are a teacher at a school or a businessman or woman, not just knowing that you should serve Christ, find ways where we engage one another to say, do you know how to treat your staff in a proper way that will bless them? Uh -uh. I just pay them and they do what I say. Maybe there's another way. And then we equip one another to be people changing a city to reflect God's glory. Now, I want to share number four and five with you today, just to close. And this is an important one. From building walls to building bridges to the community. So easily we come to that place where the overwhelming issues we face makes us tempted to build a little wall. So I had enough of your issues now. I can't stand this any longer. I'm so glad Jesus didn't say that of me. I can think of many times, say, Tops, you know the truth. Really? You do that again? This is enough. But he teaches me through that. And he sanctifies me through the Spirit. And I'm thinking, God didn't build walls to us. He built a bridge. That's Christ to us. Shouldn't we do the same and say, God, whatever in our environment is broken, we don't want to put a wall between us and them. Help us to build a bridge to say, what can we do to engage there? I believe there's great answers just in this room to communities where we need to reach out and connect. As individuals, as church together, in whatever way, where God will reveal to you. You can't just come and say, somebody should. Say, God, please use me. Can I be a bridge builder, a kingdom engineer from another embassy representing the glory of God in this space? It's very important that we say, God, will you help us and show us how to engage, how to model? Jesus said, we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Maybe he meant it. Maybe that's possible. Maybe you can bring light. Maybe you are the testimony of somebody that helped you in a way that built a bridge to your life where you said, I will never be engaging anything about God in any way, but somebody reached out to you and, and, and you are the testimony of that. And we want to say, God, show us who is busy doing great things already. Remember a few weeks ago, we spoke about the police. And we said, we are doing less now with more outcome than ever before. Why? Because we build bridges to them and we've got people to join. And next week we'll talk about how do we create this ecosystem. But as a church, we have to be ready for what God wants to do. The last one is from measuring and celebrating attendance to measuring and celebrating impact. A church needs to be healthy, but if we just celebrate how many of these seats we can fill up and we're not measuring the impact, we're losing a missional mindset. If I want to break this wall down and I've got a big hammer and I celebrate the size of my hammer, but I want to break it down, it's silly to go, look, the size of this hammer. Say, yes, but have you, have you hit the wall down yet? No, but the hammer is big. That's great. Will you start hitting that wall, please? What we measure as a church must be how well we understand this mutual reality, where every person says, God, if I know you, I know my life is completely part of who you are, and I'm an ambassador of this kingdom now. And God, I want to pray that wherever I find myself in, how significant or insignificant it might seem, I want to pray, God, that you will have impact through me in this community. I want to tell you there's not an area too small or too insignificant for you to do something great. I want to tell you a last story of this town that had a beautiful pond in the middle of it. And my best picture when I read the story is like Kuruman. Who's been to Kuruman and seen that? That's a picture in my mind. So if you've been there, use that picture. And many people in the town were having picnics around that little pond. It was the attraction of the town. People would drive past and they would go in there and they would sit around the park and this beautiful pond there in the middle, like a little lake rather. And 
the management of that town went through all the HR and everybody that's on payroll for the municipality. And they saw that Mr. Jones, for 25 years, were paid to clean the little river that's not wider than a meter that flows into this lake. And he was there every day just making sure the branches and the leaves were taken out. Not a big job. That was his job for 25 years. And they thought, whoa, we spent a lot of money on this guy over the 25 years. We don't need him any longer. I mean, what does he do? He just stands there. And then the other week he would turn it around and then he would do it that way. You know. Yeah, you have to have flexibility. They said to Mr. Jones, thank you very much for your service. We don't think we need you any longer. I don't know what he thought at that stage. Probably I'm not important enough. And there's no purpose in what I'm doing anyway. It's a few leaves a day. Within two or three weeks, they realized that the revenue of the marketplace started going down. After two months, nobody was sitting around the lake anymore because it was full of leaves and little branches. And the water started to stink. It wasn't clear enough. The fish started to die. And they wondered what was happening. And they realized, Mr. Jones. What they thought was insignificant, what he probably thought was insignificant, had an impact that he couldn't see, that they couldn't fathom, but it had a massive, massive influence on the whole community. That story has just told me, what are you doing that maybe people told you? Listen, we don't need that anymore. You need to be the mayor. You need to run the business of that town. And too many people have communities where there's a, a stinking lake. Where there's so, so many things wrong with that community. Because people are saying, I don't want to do this. I want to be the main guy. And God says, but don't you want to just clean it? You don't know what's going to happen in your community. But you need to sign up for that little part. And I'm thinking, God, I want beautiful lakes in our city. Beautiful communities that are loved and served by so many people. And this morning, I pray that God will unlock that for us. It's important that you know it's your mission and that you are part of a church that gives expression to this. As part of this month, we want to make you aware of the different places where the church is involved at. It is not limiting the work of the church. It is places where we have seen that God has called us to have an impact as a church. And I want to tell you that the, the family on mission opportunities, first of all, starts with you, and I can't emphasize it enough. You, as an individual, where you are positioned in your home, in your family place, in your community, are on that mission. And we as a church empower one another on that. And oftentimes, I'm in conversation with people who have to encourage me, and I, other people, and say, how's it going at your workplace? Ooh. And then I encourage them, and I love them as much as I can so that they know that their mission is important. That's the first place. But as a church, there are a couple of things that we do together. And I want to show you just what we do as part of our impact fund, making it possible for the people who are serving there already. So I want you to just show me the next one, please, where, where all the different things are mentioned. As a church, not two or three people on staff... It's way too big this for us to do, the few people on staff that is serving you guys and getting this done. There are so many people in church that are involved in these different things. Where we said, okay, you're on a mission, I'm on a mission, we're on a mission. Let's group together and from time to time have these ways to impact our community as church partners work together. It doesn't take the mission out of the individual. It is just saying, there's a few things God said. Guys, I think for you as a church, engage it together. As you live your life as a, as a city changer, let's do together some of these things. And we have this space. Be prepared. That's the building fund. So that the mall and the church here can come together and worship God. Where the police and our kids and um, our engagement with the shops and hope helping our people eat, our girls project, the art projects that we have, our missional outreaches. As a church, do beyond what the normal church perhaps would do, sorry to say, where it's just a bless me club. The moment we're saying as a church we want to have impact, take the hammer, hit the wall down, that is what we've been called to do. So we want to make you aware. It takes us about half a million rand to service these people in a year. We worked it out this week, and we want to have enough 
people in church that says, I'm offering my, my tithes to the church, but on top of that, I want to make sure that we reach these people so that this mission com missional community has a big impact in our city. So my invitation is to you, if you have got a, a conviction in your heart, then don't you want to engage us in these and say, okay, God, I'm going to get involved. I don't want to just know of the police station. I want to be there. We're a team already of six people on Friday morning serving there, people in church, sitting here, in the, in the, in the shop, and with our next gen at the schools, tree, where we, where we minister to the schools in, in our community. People sitting here has been the speakers and the supporters and making food and blessing the teachers. So this is what we do together. And I want to ask you to get involved, either in person or saying, listen, I've, I will pray and I want to know what to pray for. And very, very important as well to say, God, I want to invest. I want to put seed in there because it will have an impact that will change the city. And my kids and their kids, one day will know that something happened because the church, missional, as a community, made a difference. So you will see on your seat just something to help you get the information. If you're here, only when God speaks in your heart, you have to respond to that. And you, say, and you, you can take this little laminated QR code on your seat. If you don't know what it is, get one of your kids to scan it for you. They know what a QR code is, okay? And it will give you all the information. Will you prayerfully engage God and say, God, impact, community, mission, yes, that's me. And you take it with you, you scan it, and you decide if you want to put seed extra in the ground and see God do something incredible in our community. There is a table as well. If you go around the corner here and have coffee where you can take a form and you pray for it, don't just do it just because you, I don't know, think it's a good idea. It must be a God idea in your life because then we'll see God do incredible things in our city. So church, I want you to prayfully engage God in, in just seeing how as a community, now as we go into next year, how you are in a what if mindset, prayerfully. What if we all get this? What if I don't think other people should because I am comfortable just the way it is? What if I get to that place where I'm saying, yes, Lord, show me. I have no idea, but show me. What if we all get it and what will happen to our community? I want to be one of those people speak about. That church, crazy people, they actually do Jesus. What? I've had many people say to me in the last few weeks, and it's my sentiment as well, I've never been part of church with so much excitement than now. I've been in church many years. Before I came to Dr. Dow in many different churches. And I'm not, not just saying it for any other reason. It's the best time in church I've had in my entire life. Why? Because it feels to me I'm just getting a little bit of what God actually meant. And I want to be part of that. Lord, I want to pray this morning that as a church that you'll guide us and lead us. May we be the ones that respond in obedience and faith. Lord, that, that we'll be the ones that want to be a community that comes together with this mission to bring Jesus in the way that we love other people everywhere we go. And I want to pray, Lord, that this conversation we have will be finding a space in our hearts that we'll trust you, God, that we'll not look at our own lack, maybe financially, maybe spiritually, thinking, God, who am I? The Bible is full of so many stories of people that said, Lord, why will you use me? And then you profoundly use them to make you known. And I want to pray, Lord, that each one of us, wherever we have to take the leaves out of the stream, will be used to profoundly love people and give them faith and love and hope. So, Lord, will you guide us? We don't always know how to do it, but will you guide us? God, may each one of us carry that mission. Will you speak to us on how we get involved, how we become this church powerfully, Lord, so that we can see the kingdom expand as people submit their lives to you, Jesus. Thank you, God. We trust you and entrust our lives to you.